Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Stanley Museum Smart Talk, Artists, Activism, and Museums. I'm Kimberly Dachik, Curator of Learning and Engagement here at the Stanley. Smart Talks connect research and art practice at the University of Iowa to the Stanley Museum's collection. Today's event is made possible in part by the generous donation of Yvonne McCabe. This event is closed captioned. You can turn on the captions by clicking the closed caption button or selecting view subtitles. The chat and Q&A options are open. Please add comments to the chat and questions to the Q&A. We'll answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm happy to welcome Jennifer Miller as our speaker. Jennifer is a graduate assistant in the Department of Learning and Engagement at the Stanley. She has an MFA in ceramics from the University of Iowa and a master's in ESL from 2015 from Hamline University. Currently, she's a doctoral student in the College of Education's Language, Literacy, and Culture program. In this talk, Jennifer will share her research on artists, activism, and museums. Please help me welcome Jennifer. Thanks for that introduction, Kimberly. And today I'll be talking about artists, activism, and museums. The introduction pretty much covered my background here at the University of Iowa. It's important to note that I did grow up in Iowa City, and I also studied here right after my undergraduate degree. I went back to school and got a K-12 art certification. So this talk that I'm giving today weaves together perspectives of teachers, students, and community members, um, artists, museums, and activism. My presentation is going to take three parts. First, I'll start with the maker's perspective. My core identity is that of an artist and a maker. Second, I'll talk about a curator's perspective, which is an experience I had only after starting my doctoral program here. Um, I had an opportunity to work with the African American Museum of Iowa with the curator there, Felicity Wolf. The third part of this talk will take a visitor or audience perspective. Most of us experience museums as visitors, not really as artists or curators. So I'll take you to the Des Moines Art Center from the perspective of a visitor and share with you my experiences with Monument Valley and the broken treaty quilts of Gina Adams. First, I'll start with some of my early influences. And I studied ceramics and sculpture here at the University of Iowa with Isabel Barbusa was on my MFA thesis committee and she doesn't have work in the Stanley Museum of Art collection, but her work is visible on campus. She was commissioned to do a work in the main library and she used decommissioned books from the library to create public artworks um, Isabel had a big influence on me because of her use of found materials and text and also her activism, her use of materials to um, work in the world as an activist. Another person I studied with is Charles Hines or Chuck Hines and from him I learned wood firing. This is one of his teapots in the Stanley Museum of Arts collection. The third person I'm paying tribute today is Bunny McBride. These are some of his works in the collection. They're made of porcelain. There's two teapots, a bowl and a lidded vessel. When I was a master's student, we did work with the museum specifically with the Joan Manheimer collection. And I remember this piece by Wayne Higby titled Gray Water Canyon, a deceptively simple bowl, uh, Raku fired with a landscape image. Um, the nice thing about working as a graduate student with the Manheimer collection was we got to hold the pieces in our hands and see and experience how they were made. 
Another person who influenced me to want to go to graduate school was Toshiko Takeisu. This is one of her enclosed forms. It's about one foot tall and seven inches in diameter. And I saw Toshiko creating work at Northern Arizona University before I applied to graduate school. And she was one of the only women at an international wood fire conference. The way that she created her work and the way that she talked about her work was very influential in me wanting to pursue a master's in ceramics. There's another one of her pieces closed form from 1990. This is a photo of Bunny. Um, he passed away earlier this spring. He had a great influence on me looking back. I can remember the day he told me that I could not finish an MFA in ceramics unless I learned how to throw on the potter's wheel. And I had been very resistant to using the wheel. I was really interested in hand-built forms but thanks to Bunny, I did teach myself how to throw pots. This led me to my first installation piece, which also was the first time that I um, created work that I think aligns with activism. This is setting up the piece in the old Eve Drulo gallery in the old art, art um, building that was, um, it, I think it's still standing, but it's not open anymore because of the flood. So this is me installing the work. I made 365 bowls and a number of closed forms. The exhibit was titled Wetlands. I was interested in place-based activism, specifically what's happening to the landscape in Iowa. In the past 150 years, the majority of wetlands in Iowa were filled in for agricultural purposes. I also looked at studio practice as a form of activism and also craft as activism or craftivism, which is a term I learned from Gina Adams, who I'll talk about in the third part of this, um, in the third part of this presentation. My MFA thesis that I wrote was titled Ecological and Cultural Collaboration, Moving Towards a New Visual Language. This is what the exhibit looked like on day two. Um, you can see there's a combination of fired and unfired clay, and the unfired clay is drying out. You can see the clay from Iowa is kind of that darker, mustard color and I actually just dug up clay from construction sites and put it on the ground just to connect the materials that we're working with with the place where we live. There's another close-up view of the bowls. I did fill the bowls with water on a daily basis and I went in there and refilled them every day so there was kind of a nice calm feeling in the in the gallery. And the issue of wetlands, as I said, in the past 150 years, wetlands in Iowa, the majority have been destroyed. And so there's a movement towards restoring Iowa wetlands. Another person who influenced me was Betsy Damon, and I heard her speak at the College Art Association Conference in New York. Um, she started an organization called Keepers of the Waters in 1991, and this is an example of some of the work that she did in Chengdu, China. It was a collaborative piece where the people in Chengdu transformed a dump that was next to the river into an ecological park called the Living Water Garden. Um, if you're interested in learning more about her work, you can find it on her website. I joined a local chapter of Keepers of the Waters at the time in the late 19, uh, around 2000, 2002. There was a chapter in Duluth, Minnesota, and I was a member of the board of directors and I also helped design a logo for their publications. I continued to work with themes of water and marshlands. This is marshland elegy installation I did when I was an adjunct professor 
up at the College of St. Catherine, now St. Catherine University. And what you're looking at here are three juvenile whooping cranes made out of stoneware with the chino glaze and about, I don't know how many hundreds of thumbprints. So I've made porcelain thumbprints and I inscribed, I'll show you the next slide. Um, the thumbprints contain the words from Aldo Leopold's Marshland Elegy. It's an essay that he published in 1948. And so inside each one of these thumbprints are some of the some of the essay text. And if you circumnavigate this installation, you could actually read the whole thing, although it's a little bit difficult and not so legible. So I was interested in um, legibility, language, what happens with landscape over time. And as always, as an activist, not much can happen just to raise consciousness in an exhibition or an installation. So I align myself with the International Crane Foundation, where I've been a member off and on over the years. When I can afford the membership, I join the International Crane Foundation, who's working for causes that I want to support. All right, part two. I'm going to move to the curator's perspective. In the summer of 2021, I worked with the African American Museum of Iowa in Cedar Rapids. It was sponsored by the Overman Center's Humanities for the Public Good program, and I was an intern with curator Felicity Wolf. She was putting together the exhibit titled Unwavering 21st Century Activism. The exhibit is open now, and it's open through August 7th, 2021. So if you're anywhere near Cedar Rapids, I recommend going to, to see the exhibit in person. Shortly after I started my internship, um, we were made to work remotely because of COVID. And there was also the outcry following the murder of George Floyd. So a statement was issued by the African American Museum of Iowa's executive director, who recognized the museum's unique position and the important role of the museum as a resource for people, both um, historically as well as currently, who are seeking real answers and who also need social justice platforms. So the role of the museum is really important. Um, it aligned very well with the exhibit theme also. I'm gonna highlight Lanisha's statement that I underlined in yellow about activism, she said, whether you march, employ, implore your legislature, kneel or stand up to lawlessness, please do consider your own personal responsibility towards ensuring all people are treated with dignity and humanity. All lives don't matter until black lives matter. With the support of the African American Museum of Iowa, we organized an event in the event hall, which is a spacious room. And we invited people from the community to come together and express themselves through art creation. There was an opportunity to work with two local artists, Savannah, uh, Savannah Simmons and Dante Hayes. They led a mural project. Um, this is the mural that they created titled Black Lives Persist. The mural is in the exhibition right now. Community members could also come and make works of art, small works of art on paper or cardboard with or without stencils. And there were a bunch of stencils provided by PS1, a nonprofit arts organization here in Iowa City. Some of the pieces were donated to the museum and are now installed in the museum, a wall filled with uh, protest signs. And a second part of my work with the African American Museum of Iowa is the virtual writing project. We were trying to figure, not everybody wants to paint or get messy or make protest signs. And so 
we created an online virtual writing project that people could contribute their ideas to. There were five themes, honoring the past, speaking about the present, imagining the future, blind spots and comfort zones. I felt like these themes would intersect well if teachers wanted to use this as a, as a um, teaching opportunity for their students to engage. Um, and the project is ongoing. Eventually it'll become part of the African American Museum's archives and people can look back at this writing and look back at this point in time and see what people were thinking and writing about. Okay, part three of my presentation looks at a visitor's perspective. As I said at the beginning, most of us experience museums as audience members and visitors. So in January of 2020, I drove over to Des Moines and stopped into the Art Center and visited this exhibit, exhibition titled Monument Valley. Walking into the exhibit, there were three hanging quilts. They were the broken treaty quilts created by Gina Adams. She calls herself a contemporary hybrid artist. She has American Ojibwe roots, as well as Irish and Lithuanian heritage. Uh, this is a phone photo of me standing next to some of her quilts, just to give you an idea of the scale. And what Gina does is she finds quilts that are about 150 years old. So antique quilts that she uses um, as the substrate, and then she layers onto these quilts calico and other fabrics cut out and put onto the surface of the quilts. And the words are taken from treaties that were created and then broken. The treaties were created by the US government and the Canadian government um, with indigenous tribes. They were created and then broken over the years. When I was an undergraduate, I tried to learn oil painting, and this is an example of one of my early oil paintings from 1990. I visited a quilt show in southern Iowa, and I was struck by the power of these hanging fabrics and all the community work and labor that goes into these. A lot of quilts are not made by individual artists, but they're a collaborative effort. And so um, I think the reason that Gina's work struck me is because I have a heritage and an association with quilting. This is a detail of one of her quilts titled Treaty with the Choctaw, 1786. And as already mentioned, she uses antique quilts and hand cut calico letters. What I like about this detail is it shows how text becomes legible and Ill illegible, readable and unreadable at the same time. If you wanna know more about her work, there's a complete statement on her website about this work in progress. There's also quite a bit emerging about um, like videos and things, talks that she's given about Gina's work. What I wanted to highlight here is the reason that she chose calico fabric. Um, she chose the calico fabric because it's the first industrialized commodity and it made, it was made in the United States and then exported to Europe. The fabric made many white men very wealthy and she chooses to place the broken treaty onto antique quilts that are about the same age and appear worn and broken. They're about the same age as the time period when the original treaty would have been written. I interviewed Gina in February of 2021 as a part of my doctoral research. And she told me that while she was a student at the University of Kansas, she worked with the Spencer Museum of Art and Archives. And during this 
work in a museum. I don't know if it was that museum specifically or others that she's worked within. Working within the museum solidified her idea that that was the kind of place her work needed to be installed. So why are museums the place where she wants her work to be seen? She told me that it's because museums are colonized posts or places and that they represent the time of manifest destiny, the time when all major museums were placing quote unquote objects of belonging into the artifact category. So I highlighted on this slide objects of belonging because that phrase I'd never heard it before until I interviewed Gina and I've been thinking about it ever since. What does she mean? What does it mean to change the word artifact into objects of belonging? So in this interview, Gina said, quote, the collections in the archives are not just archives, but they belong. They're objects of belonging. They're waking up, they have a voice. They are animate, not inanimate, as they have been viewed by Western culture who have stored them. And I feel this way often when I visit museums. Um, she's putting words into something that makes a lot of sense to me. I still have to think more about what she means. Gina also said, quote, how can I rene renegotiate that space? Place my work in a museum, first by going backwards in time and then by coming forwards and imagining the future. So this is the question she's asking herself. How do artists renegotiate spaces within museums? How do living artists who work and are commissioned to work in museums? One thing that she does is um, engage the community when she can. And at the Des Moines Arts Center, she also did a performance. And so in her performance, she read aloud one of the treaties that was on display there. And so by performing and reading aloud the words of the treaty, <clears throat> I think that's a part of the renegotiating and listening to the words be spoken aloud is part of her artistic practice. Along with the Broken Treaty quilts, she has a side project, another project called Broken Treaty Medallions. And these are some examples of the medallions. They take the imagery from the quilt and they, um, the images from the quilt are turned into decals and the decals are placed on ceramic medallions. And these medallions also have braided hemp rope. So they're to be worn around your neck and small handmade beads. I think that she's very strategic about engaging the audience and figuring out ways for her activism to translate to individual collectors who would want to purchase one of these medallions um, and wear it and further advocate for um, the cause that she's speaking towards with her broken treaty quilt project. If you want to learn more about these, you can find information about these projects on Gina Adams' website. So returning to the Stanley Museum of Art, I'm closing out my presentation with a few questions. This is a jar. It's from Ethiopia. And it was donated in 1998 to the University of Iowa Museum of Art, now the Stanley Museum of Art, by an anonymous donor so when I look at this jar, I think, is this a part of the collection? Is this an object of belonging? You know, what are we looking at here? And the reason that this, this kind of work captures my attention is um, because my husband and I lived in Ethiopia for three and a half years. We were part of the Peace Corps and we worked as educators. This is a photo I took of my neighborhood in Deborah Marcos. And there's a similar form um, with the flared lip and the, the vessel and the handles. So this form is still being made. In 2012, I took this photo. And I'm thinking about 
let's go back. I'm thinking about context and how a curator or how an audience member, somebody who visits the museum, how is a curator going to present this kind of work? And also what opportunities does this kind of work in a museum present for people who might come to the University of Iowa and want to do research in the future? So in the future, I might want to do some research on this. I have done some research on ceramic artists in Ethiopia, and I'm also um, very interested in contextualizing this pot as something that speaks about the clay, about the material, about the function, but also about accessibility and social justice, accessibility to water, um, the role of women in Ethiopia, and social justice issues. So my current activism is, and my current research as a doctoral student is trending towards digital activism. This is a screenshot of a Facebook post from April 13th. And I'm closing with this because you can see in the photos, there's people marching on the streets. Um, it's part of the civil disobedience movement that's taking place right now in Burma or Myanmar. I lived in Mandalay from 2015 to 2017, and I worked at Mandalay University. So when I see this photo of people in Mandalay on the streets holding a traditional ceramic water offering pot and marching and filling the pot with, um, they're doing a peaceful protest. So filling the pots with water and with plants and then marching, this took place on April 13th, which is the beginning of the New Year festivities in, in Mandalay and in Myanmar. And so currently I'm following this and I'm wondering what would ever happen in the future if one of these ceramic pots made it to an art museum, how would the pots be seen? How would we read the pots? How would curators present the pots? And I kind of like seeing pots in action in a street march though. So, um, I was just gonna close with that and open it up now for questions. If anybody has any questions, thank you so much. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, if anybody has questions, please post those into the Q&A box or you could drop those into chat. Um, I'll get started uh, as people kind of gather their thoughts. Um, so Jen, how has your experience as an artist, as a curator, and as a researcher and someone who visits museum, how have all of those different experiences kind of informed each other? Are there new questions that you found emerging from your research um, or from your perspective as a maker or curator that has sort of shifted as a result of inhabiting all of these different spaces? That's a good question. And I think the answer comes in um, thanks to Call Me A Strong. Who's, I took a material analysis class from her last fall, and she's with the University of Iowa Center for the Book and also runs PS1, or is one of the directors of Public Space One. Um, during her class, I was presenting on an organization called Center for Artistic Activism. And when I look at what they do, and they have a website, C4AA, Center for Art Artistic Activism, it made me think more deeply about what constitutes effective activism and what artists can do in community and in community analysis and participatory analysis to really affect change. And so what I found with my own work and with a lot of work is sometimes it gets stuck at the level of affect. So even just visiting Gina Adams exhibit of those broken treaty quilts in Des Moines, I had a very strong emotional response and not everybody will, not everybody who visits that exhibit will have the same response to her quilts. They might respond to something else, but is raising your consciousness through emotional response to work enough? And how do we train? I didn't get training when I was in my MFA program on how to be an effective artist and activist. I don't think I was even conscious at the time that I wanted to work as an activist. I admired Betsy Damon, who's extremely successful as an activist. Obviously I included her in this show or in this presentation, but um, 
I think the doctoral work that I've been doing and also a class I took with Jackie Rand last fall, Jackie Rand offers offered a class um, on museums and the history of museums, which also really opened my my mind to the role of museums historically, which Gina Adams referenced as well. Um, how they kind of evolved along the lines of manifest destiny and how collections were acquired by museums and now what are museums supposed to do and how does this interface with activism and what are the current what are the current issues facing museums as well as the public so um, all of these things have the doctoral program i'm in has given me the time to learn from other experts and also to re-examine how artists work in the world, how we choose to or don't choose to work within institutions and what's possible. Thanks, Jen. The phrase that Gina Adams used, objects of belonging is so striking because it brings in the aspects of an object that kind of get erased sometimes within a museum or that we can forget about, that these are really active parts of a community. They are um, objects that can signal belonging to a group or can be part of initiation or other ceremonial um, rituals that bring people together within the community. What are some of the questions that you're still kind of wrestling with with this phrase, objects of belonging in your own work or in relation to collections? Um, well, for example, this piece that's right in front of us, the jar from Ethiopia, this will have a different sense of belonging for people who recognize it from their childhood. So when it comes to the quilts, those felt like objects of belonging because I grew up with my grandmother's quilts in our household. Um, and so, and also like with bunnies, Bunny's pieces are in the collection now, Bunny McBride's pieces, but I also have his pieces in our house. And so those are pieces that we use on a daily basis. They're crafted, they're made by hand. Um, this also is a piece that's made by hand and would have been used before it was donated to the museum, you know, used to gather water. There is a rope that's put through this and it's carried on a person's back. Usually a woman will carry these on their back and there's a thick rope that kind of goes over the shoulders. And I saw many people using these um, still in my community in Deborah Marcos, not uncommon. So when I just see this decontextualized my real question is, I don't know that I read this as an object of belonging because I didn't grow up in Ethiopia, but I recognize it just from having lived there for three and a half years, but I still have a, a respectful distance with this. It's familiar only from seeing it, but I never actually used one, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. We've got kind of two follow-up questions from this coming in. Um, one from Carolyn saying, I think what you have described might be a topic for a dissertation. Are you by chance considering it? Um, the whole, the whole presentation? Yes. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm considering several threads of research and I really got a lot out of um, calling Gina Adams and speaking with her on Zoom, something I never would have done in the past. But being in a doctoral program initiated my interest in seeing what artists say about their work. So um, it could become a dissertation. I don't have a clear vision of yet how I transfer all of this into writing. So there's there's the there's the development, the direction of my development that I need to go in. The academic writing is kind of an obstacle for me, has been. Yeah, it's definitely challenging to bring all of those things together. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a question um, from Sharman Hunter. Uh, what effect did Ethiopia have on your artwork? Why Ethiopia? And he says, I lived many years in Nigeria and Liberia. Hmm. Um, living in Ethiopia, I worked with materials that were available and I worked with 
pre-service and in-service teachers. So mostly when I was living in Ethiopia, it was with Peace Corps. Um, we didn't choose at that time where we were sent. And so now you can choose where you go if you want to join Peace Corps. Um, it's suspended right now, but it will reopen, I think, in the fall. So we were in Ethiopia because Peace Corps matched us with the education program at that time. And the artwork that I did when I was living there took the form of books, bookmaking, and working with people on small uh, books instead of just importing books from other countries or you know books were prohibitively expensive and so i worked with teachers to make our own books so thanks for sharing your experience there jennifer mm -hmm. um and we've got another uh comment from caravan that i can kind of speak to a little bit and maybe jen you can kind of speak to as well as sort of your Kind of hope for museums. Um, Carolyn asks, is this the direction that research with the museum is heading, reaching out? Um, and I think that this is something at the Stanley that we're thinking about. How do we um, connect our objects that we have in our collection to the population in Iowa and beyond? Um, so these aren't just objects that we have sitting in the museum on display, but that they are um, kind of reanimated in some ways so that they can make real connections and continue those in, in new um, kind of exciting ways. Um, and Jen, kind of, I'd like to hear from you just sort of what your vision is for museums and objects and kind of those questions of what happens to them and what it, what's their potential. Um, the only thing that comes to mind when I hear that question is thinking about programs that you could have in museums. And I noticed that in the museum, there aren't any coffee pots or jebanas. And the coffee pot and the Ethiopian coffee ceremony is a really big part of the culture. So if there were people from Ethiopia who wanted to share the coffee culture um, with Iowans, they could host a coffee ceremony and then somebody, I don't know, maybe as part of a conference or just as an informal meeting, um, they could host a coffee ceremony and then have discussions about the pieces. There, there are several pieces in the of um, objects of belonging or objects in the collection from Ethiopia. And I think it would be really interesting to talk about those objects there's a cross um and there's a painting i think of the story of solomon and there are several um other vessels so i think hosting programs would be great but i'm not sure if there are members of the community with um roots and connections and from ethiopia who would be interested in doing something like that but it would be an opportunity for their expertise and their hospitality to be the center and the focal point. Yeah, definitely. And and Karen Carolyn follows up. Um, can museums and objects of belonging be ways of reaching out to new patrons? And I think um, Jen, kind of what you're getting at in your answer, and what I think is really important for museums to consider is um, what communities need and what they're interested in. Um, and so I think opening up these conversations to people who maybe haven't been to the museum before or aren't aware of it, especially a museum like ours that has been closed and just in temporary spaces for so long, as we're approaching a new building, thinking about reaching out, making connections and really getting a sense of what's needed, what's wanted, and how can we help make those needs and wants come to fruition in different ways through our programming, through our exhibitions, and through other um, activities that we're offering through the museum. And also we can expand the community beyond just those who live in Eastern Iowa. I'm not, I mean, it could be, you could welcome people in digitally and expand the community in that way. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think this last year has really shown us how we can, make connections really broadly across the country and across the world um, by bringing in digital resources and thinking really thoughtfully about how we are able to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Jen, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your, your research and your work. It's been, it's opened up a lot of interesting conversations and giving us a lot of things to think about. And I really appreciate Jeannie Adams sharing the, her phrase, objects of belonging, and you're kind of thinking through that um, in your presentation as well. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we have a Grant Wood Fellow presentation coming up at the end of April, and we hope we'll see you there. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, bye.